even if we are a little bit in a carbon winter and in a crypto winter, as you said, I still would say the majority of projects, half of the projects that Philip and myself see at Crane Earth or as angels in the last three, four months, is still in the carbon space, carbon financing, carbon trading, retirement, MRV, digital MRV. It's, it's the majority of projects. So when we when we talk refi, even in this winter environment, uh, it's it's still carbon. Welcome to the Regeneration Will Be Funded. My name is Matthew Monahan, and in this series, we're exploring the intersections of regenerative finance, technology, and our living planet. Created with Ma Earth, you can find all of our conversations and more at maearth.com. Thanks for joining us. Today's guest is Max Amit from Crane Earth. Max is an accomplished repeat founder who's now raising a VC investment fund in the Web3 impact space. In this conversation, Max shares what he's seen across the refi landscape, why he believes carbon credits make sense on chain, and why this market will persist despite recent challenges. We go into Crane Earth's strategy and investment thesis, and also talk about things like tokens and regulatory considerations. This discussion took place at the Refi Summit in Seattle in May 2023. Let's dive in. Max Ament. Today we are here with Max Ament. Max is the founder and partner at Crane Earth. Thanks for being here, Max. Thanks for having me. Uh, what is Crane Earth? Crane Earth is a early stage VC fund in London, and uh, we invest in the intersection of Web3 and climate, or Web3 and impact. So wherever Web3 decentralization is used to have a real world impact. That's our scope, our focus. Nice. And we had a great conversation with your co-founder, Philip Stelic, mm -hmm. when he was visiting New Zealand, and he talked a bit about the, um, the background of the projects that you guys have been working on together for quite some time. In this conversation, really excited to go deeper into what you're seeing in the Web3 space and what's motivating you around uh, this focus uh, for Crane Earth. But before we go there, we'd love to yeah, maybe hear a bit of the journey. How did you come into this field? And maybe starting from the beginning of the entrepreneurial side, um, yeah, a bit of your background. So it might be a little bit overlap with uh, what Philip already shared because we know each other for 20 years and did all the shit together uh, pretty much. So, but um, I'm a little bit older than Philip, so I started earlier. Um, started my career at SAP as a software engineer, mm. built SAP's payment program. So SAP, for those who don't know, is a big German ERP software company for corporates. Mm -hmm. So I built their payment program. After a year and a half, I realized corporates are not my thing, uh, mm -hmm. like working there. Um, had a first startup in the accounts payable space, bootstrapped. Philip joined that startup. Um, we sold it uh, in 2006 when Philip and myself already were in, the, in San Francisco. And um, yeah, after that, uh, a few failed attempts. We did QR codes in 2007. <laughs> Nobody cared about QR codes in 2007. There wasn't even an iPhone that could read them. So that didn't go that well. And then we built a company called Taulia, supplier financing, where we go to the big guys, to the Home Depots, to the Apples of the world, to the Intels, and finance their supply chains. So their suppliers that wait typically 60, 90 days for their money, we help those suppliers to get money earlier. Um, we did the opposite of bootstrapping. So raised, I think, 300 million of, of venture capital over several rounds. And fun fact, we sold that company a year ago back to SAP, where I started my career wow. uh, back then. Uh, but Philip and myself already left about five, six years ago and created a blockchain protocol for real world assets called Centrifuge. Um, and uh, there we left as well a few years ago and focused more on investing um, in Web3 other areas. And more recently, the last 12 months, 18 months, very much in Web3 and impact. And out of this angel investment came the fund. That's, mm. that's pretty much the story. Great. Yeah. Perfect encapsulation and summary. And so what does kind of real world assets and impact? Let's unpack those terminology. Um, what, what do those words mean? Yeah. Let's start with real world assets. I mean, 
only in crypto real world asset means something, right? right? I mean, if I talk to a banker, a TradFi person, like it's an asset, right? <laughs> Obviously, everything is a real world asset, mm -hmm. so it's just an asset. So I kind of like the term, but just to clarify, the real world asset is, is something that you tokenize, where you take it from the real world here, it's like an invoice, a mortgage, like anything that exists digitally in the real world, mm -hmm. you bring it on chain, you tokenize it. That's a real world asset. Um, and it, there's some implications as well. To, or some, some carbon credits could be a real-world asset. Right? They exist in the real world, the Veras certify them or the gold standards or whatever, mm -hmm. and you want to bring them on-chain, you want to tokenize them, well, it becomes then a real-world asset on-chain. And why are we doing that? Well, we think we can do beautiful things with them on-chain. Mm -hmm. We can finance them, we can trade them easier, we can build financial instruments around those real-world assets as soon as they are on-chain, and we don't need the the legacy payment system, the legacy finance infrastructure for that. Mm -hmm. That's that's in essence the mm -hmm. real world asset definition. Right, right. And then what about impact? Well, impact is anything. Yeah, that's a good, good question. It's a pretty broad term, sure. right? Um, and uh, our, our investment thesis when, when we talk about impact is we're looking for Web3 projects that for projects, startups in that leverage Web3 to bring impact value into the real world mm. that could be money it very often is in, in form of climate financing project financing um, that could be using web3 uh, to scale a project that does have an impact in the real world so in general it, it real world impact means for us something that is not just for the sake of web3 like mm. i build an exchange to trade more uh, eth to do this uh, 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 this leverage um, to buy more bitcoin yes we need all that don't give a shit about it personally. Mm -hmm. I like that those uh, that infrastructures exist, but to get money and impact and value back into the real economy, into the hands of project developers, small medium businesses, employees that wait for their money. Mm -hmm. That's that's what I mean with impact and impact in the real world. Right, right. And so you're starting a fund in this space, Crane Earth, early stage venture fund, and I guess implicit in that is that you're making a bet or that you have a belief or a thesis. And what I'm hearing so far is that one of those, the components of that thesis is that moving things on chain is kind of a macro it's um, part of it, yeah. characteristic of what's happening. Can, you know, especially for someone who still doesn't have that basic point of view that, that we're going through this tectonic shift of moving things on chain. Can you explain, you know, why do you feel like that's important and why do you think it's, you know, either the future or important to be part of the future? Yeah. And so, and by the way, I think moving things on chain is just the first step. Mm. Originating things on chain will be the, the end stage. But let's be real yeah, here. Right. This is not next year. This is not in 10 years. This is a long term play that mm. where things an invoice again, my, my favorite business thing, mm -hmm. an invoice will at one point not originate in an SAP system or QuickBooks. It will be in an on chain environment. So we don't have to bring things on chain anymore. But let's mm -hmm. let's be real. Everything is still in the right. in the in the in the meat space in the real world. And so why do we want them on chain is your question, mm -hmm. right? So what's, what's, what's the plus here? Well, I think there's a couple of things that make uh, uh, objects and business easier on chain. Um, there's a typical, we don't need all those middlemen anymore, right? And th this is a problem. If you finance, specifically in finance, there's dozens of parties in the middle that take a little bit a basis point here and another basis point here for insurance, for payment agent, mm -hmm. for you pick it, dozens of reasons. Well, we can have that on chain and smart contracts and the visibility to be on chain, just solve that or at least reduce it. Mm -hmm. Makes it cheaper for all parties involved. And that means as well, um, you can have smaller, smaller facilities. So you don't need hundreds of millions of facilities because everybody takes a little bit. Mm -hmm. You can have small facilities uh, to lend to people. Um, that's one thing. In the carbon markets, maybe, why do I firmly believe or like truly believe that it makes complete sense to move them on chain or have them on chain in the first place? Mm -hmm. uh, there's a million of reasons. One of them is transparency, like the good old blockchain pitch of everything is there, visible, immutable. It's kind of cool to have that uh, on, mm. of a carbon credit, uh, mm. specifically if we know that 95% of the non-on-chain ones are bullshit. So seeing that actually, okay, the carbon credit came out of this and there's this fucking tree uh, that we planted, it's pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. um, so like, I believe that that specifically in, in, in impact or in, in climate, um, this is the primary use case of, of a blockchain that I saw. And that's why we're so excited about Crane Earth. Got it. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think that like there's the 
the disintermediation, so removal of lots of inefficient yeah. intermediaries, all clipping the ticket, that's obviously results in speed, it results in lower costs and just more efficiency. Um, and then there's the transparency that you just mentioned. It's like by having this shared ledger system uh, or chain or blockchain, um, we have a greater degree of programmability around transparency and sort of find where things originate to learn about the life cycle. And, you know, this affects finance, but also affects supply chains, it affects 100%. all sorts of business functions. And like, you know, our whole world and global economy has so many of these different pieces that are trying to work together. Um, it's almost like we can't imagine what types of um, unlock will exist as we start to use more of a shared mm -hmm. system. Um, are there any other aspects yeah. of the on-chain environment that you feel are really exciting? Let, let's pick the, you mentioned it before, like the programmability, mm. and it sounds a bit cheesy, but the programmability of values. So, so you have that money, that internet money, and you can actually code into it what should happen with it. And a very basic uh, uh, example is that in a certain carbon credit, you, you that guy gets sold at one point, it's on-chain. Well, a portion of it, a meaningful portion, goes actually back to the communities mm -hmm. uh, that uh, that were responsible to, it, to to create that carbon credit, to plant a tree, to create the solar panels. You build that into smart contract. It's not changeable. It's immutable again. Mm -hmm. um, it's automated. Nobody can change it. I like that a lot. Mm -hmm. I like that a lot. That this is there. It's visible for me. I know that I invest in this carbon credit. I buy it. A few basis points, a few percentage, 20%, whatever the number is, goes mm -hmm to the people that are responsible for making it happen, to the stewards. Mm -hmm. Kind of cool. Yeah. And it sounds like you're thinking a lot about carbon credits. We're at the ReFi Summit in Seattle right now. There's a lot of talk about carbon credits. That's true. Um, it also feels, you know, we were joking last night, like this is somewhat of the, the winter, so to speak, season for both crypto as well as kind of carbon credits. Yeah. I mean, just a couple of days ago, the Vera CEO stepped down. You know, we're seeing kind of a, a lot of hesitation from larger buyers in the carbon credit markets, wondering about the integrity of the credits. There's just a lot of, yeah, I guess, doubt and reflection happening in the carbon space right now. Curious, you know, where do you stand in terms of thinking about the legitimacy of a carbon credit market? Um, and then maybe we can dive into kind of the opportunities that we're seeing. Yeah. I mean, one, one aspect is even if we are a little bit in a carbon winter and in a crypto winter, as you said, I still would say the majority of projects, half of the projects that Philip and myself see at Crane Earth or as angels in the last three, four months mm. is still in the carbon space, carbon financing, carbon trading, retirement. MRV, digital MRV, it's, it's the majority of projects. So when we when we talk refi, even in this winter environment, uh, it's it's still carbon. Um, mm -hmm. Why? There were a couple of questions, I think, or at least a couple of flavors. Why do we believe that carbon needs to be on chain? Mm -hmm. we, we picked a few, but the, the most important one is there is no real infrastructure out there yet. If, okay. if we forget about Web three, there's just here's nothing. There's some fax machines, some Excel sheets. And some consulting companies. That's the mm -hmm. that's the carbon landscape. And I know there's a few startups that would disagree, but that's that's how I see the world. So I think we have a fucking responsibility to build it on the right foundation. And the mm -hmm. right foundation is for the reasons we stated before, Web3. Mm -hmm. Decentralized, immutable, transparent, less middlemen, all that good stuff. So that's why I'm still bullish, even if we are in the winter, mm -hmm. that this is the right uh the right way. And we what is missing in the carbon space right now? The buyers don't have trust. Mm -hmm. The buyers just after after the Guardian and the Zeit, the German uh, Die Zeit articles, you know, they don't trust them anymore. Mm -hmm. um, I do believe that we can bring that trust back by 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 providing carbon credits with quality that are transparent, and I see where it comes from. Mm -hmm. What had been done there? I think uh, Web three will create that trust and will enable buyers to comfortably buy again. And just taking a step even further back, like what. Um has your process been of getting comfortable with the even idea of carbon credits as being the um, a, a, a ecological solution? I see. I see. Yeah. Um, look, I mean, not a climate expert. I came into that field. I wanted to get into the field for, for a long time and never saw the opportunity. Mm. How? And then two years ago when Tucan and, and Flow Carbon happened, there was like a natural wow moment for me. Now I mm. have the opportunity to actually be where I need to be and want to be. Mm -hmm. um, that said, I mean, generally speaking, we cannot reduce emissions fast enough. We want, um, and even if we stop, I think emitting today to zero, which is obviously not not happening, we need we need in addition a carbon removal strategy. Mm. And uh, I do believe one of the best ideas concepts is uh, carbon offsets, carbon credits. 
Is it perfect? No. Uh, can we make it better? Can we get to the almost perfect state? Hopefully with mm. Web3 and some mm -hmm. other technologies? I think so. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm not a... And there's a lot of philosophical discussions on carbon credits, whether they can be should be traded or retired immediately. Mm -hmm. Not my discussion, not the yeah. expert on that, I will admit. Got it. Got it. Okay, so looking at carbon credits and Web3, you know, what we've, we've kind of established the base um, idea here of, okay, it makes sense to move them on chain. Yes. Um, specifically now, like, what are you seeing as opportunities or gaps in the market? Yeah. So I think to uh, touch on it a, a little bit. The moving on chain is one thing, mm -hmm. but it reminds me a lot on, on, on what I did in fintech for years. It's like you had to play with the banks, you had to play nice with them, and it's mm -hmm. painful. Um, it's just you still you're still building on top of their mm -hmm. uh, archaic systems. You're at mercy of their APIs, file systems, or whatever mm -hmm. nonsense they, they they provided. And it's very similar in the carbon market. There's a Vera, there's Gold Standard. I'm not trying to shit on them. I think many of them try to do a good job, but still. There's some blocking. There's where I'm going to is yes, we need an in between step of bridging, of bringing the carbon, the existing carbon markets on chain. But I see more and more projects popping up that like do it originally on chain. They have their methodologies, um, they have their their processes, and they become a registry on chain directly. So we don't need to bridge and tokenize anymore. Everything happens naturally on chain. I think that's the end state, and it's. What we discussed with finance will take decades. Mm. I think with carbon markets, because there isn't a lot yet, I think we're there in a few years. Mm. Where we don't need Averas anymore. Mm. So you are imagining that the origination of carbon credits happens on chain rather than needing to bridge the existing I, incumbents. I, I will. I'll see that. Yeah. Yeah. And um, that origination. I mean, are there? Are there? Is it as simple as like Vera just going, oh, okay, well, rather than storing it in this Excel sheet, we're going to start storing it over here on Ethereum. But like, how much different is that shift of process for the originators to move their paradigm into the on-chain there, there, environment? There, there, there needs, there's work that needs to be done. I mean, the whole MRV process um, it needs to shift on-chain, at least the mm. results of it documented. But other than that, I don't see it as a, as a, as a huge step. And I'm quite frankly not sure if the Veras have the right incentives to, to, to move it on chain. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I'll, I'll see enough non Veras uh, building the Vera replacements right now. Got it. And let's talk maybe a bit about MRV. Um, so measuring, reporting, verification. Obviously, like we need to verify mm -hmm. the outcomes in order to create legitimacy to say yes, that you know sequestered so much carbon. So therefore, there's a credit that is legitimately issued. What are you seeing across the MRV landscape? So um, we did uh, like open forest protocol is, is one project that we love mm -hmm. where um, it's about planting trees. That's, that's what it boils down to. And then verifying that those trees are actually planted and grow. Um, and they do that uh, yeah, by having a decentralized network of planters, obviously, and validators using a mobile app take pictures, measure, mm -hmm. um, but then as well have uh, validators, uh, again, decentralized that go like physically there and validate uh, 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 certain things. They use satellite data to combine it and it's all stored on chain. I think in their case, it's the near protocol. I personally don't care what blockchain it is. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a great project uh, that I love. I uh, started some discussions with a pure MRV uh, protocol, um, not yet necessarily Web3 enabled, um, that specializes on blue carbon, um, like uh, 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 mangroves in, in that particular case, mm -hmm. which, which I find interesting. Um, I, I do believe some MRV is interesting in, 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 in the tech area when it comes to enhanced rock weathering or, or, or others, uh, other areas. So we see quite some specialized startups in that space. Mm -hmm. um, agriculture um, is as well something which uh, has some powerful uh, impact. So yeah, those are mm -hmm. some places we see. Yeah, it's, it feels like the technology around sensors and the ability to streamline some of the reporting and verification standards here are all percolating from many different directions. Exactly. Like soil sensors Comes together. or satellites or ocean or DNA or like, I mean, there's just so many things that are kind of coalescing to bring us greater degrees of precision um, and robustness of being able to observe our natural world. Yes. And then now it's a question of coordination across all of these fragmented exactly. areas 
and how do we create incentives? And it's like, hello, this is what blockchain is exactly. for. Exactly, has a name on it, right? Yeah. That's, that's what I think. And you brought up a, a good thing, I think, on the carbon markets, which we see as well. There was a lot of talk, talk over the last few years on that, but it's finally happening. It's not just about the carbon credit. It's mm -hmm. not just about how much uh, we sequestered. It's about the additionality, like our additional benefits that are around, like mm -hmm. an, an ecologically benefit framework is discussed. Mm -hmm. What the biodiversity impact? What is the soil quality? How much water does the land hold? Stuff like that gets, it's not there yet. You, you cannot buy those things, or maybe you can, but not, not easily. Mm -hmm. But like a common credit that has those attributes on it, mm -hmm. like uh, a five out of five on biodiversity. And um, those things happen right now. I'm really excited to bring again all those different MRVs, technologies together and scale it worldwide. Yeah, yeah, what, uh, what many people refer to as co-benefits. Co-benefits. I'm worth curious, things. do you think that we are going to move into a world where there's lots of different types of carbon credits and some of them have like premium carbon credits because they have, you know, other biodiversity or water co-benefits? Yeah. Or do you think that we're going to move into a world where there's kind of like a, a narrow view of carbon credits and then there's like biodiversity credits or water credits that kind of sit in that we end up with this polarity of ecological credit classes. Yeah. I do not know the answer. I'll, I'll, I'll kind of as an investor, but as well uh, mm. intellectually take a bet on both. Mm. I think I think it will definitely uh, happen on the carbon credits itself with yeah. the co-benefits, part of, of some groups that discuss that and create a framework. So that's cool. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, I do believe there will be, and there's plastic credits already, there's renewable energy credits, mm -hmm. there can be soil credits. Um, will there be biodiversity credits? It's, it's a little bit harder to imagine in a biodiversity world. Mm -hmm. It's solvable, but it's not as fungible, mm -hmm. uh, a biodiversity. Yeah, I killed the species here. I cannot just offset it by buying a biodiversity credit for saving some right. ants. And no disrespect to ants, but but you get my point, right? Sure. Uh, it's very different to, to combine it, whereas uh, a ton of uh, greenhouse gas is a ton of greenhouse gas. Mm -hmm. um, so the fungibility on biodiversity is a little bit more complex, I guess, uh, mm -hmm. than it is in other areas. So yeah. not sure how that will be solved, but I know people work on that. Yeah, yeah, totally. And I'm glad I'm glad to see so much open discussion, relatively speaking. Like it doesn't feel to me like in these environments with Refi Summit that people are unaware of going beyond carbon. Like, I think that there's just a recognition that we haven't, we, we don't have carbon figured out and that's where all of the momentum is. And yet it's still like very early days in terms of really getting the infrastructure and the markets in place. And so, yes, there is focus, um, but it's not at, uh, hopefully at the expense of thinking about the entire ecosystem. Agreed. Does that, yeah, is that yeah, how you're feeling? Yeah, yeah, as yeah, well? no, no, I, I hear. Mm. Cool. Okay, so with Crane Earth so far, I know you guys are still just very early days, but have you made any investments? And can you talk a little bit about how you're constructing the portfolio? Yeah, yeah, sure. So it, it's a 30 million vehicle that we aim for and slightly different maybe to other 30 million funds, specifically in, in the refi space, which aren't a lot. Uh, we want to lead. So mm. we, we feel what the space needs uh, are some investors that, that do the dirty work, that mm -hmm. spends, spend some weeks on the due diligence, set the price, work with the team, and get the deal done. So we want to we want to do some our strategies to do fifteen to twenty um, investments over the fund life cycle. Mm -hmm. um, we did already one. Uh, our first closing is coming up, uh, so we had to warehouse. And we did one first investment as a it's a protocol and it happens to be uh, in, in in Madrid, which where I live. Um, but, but just a coincidence. In Madrid, you said. In, uh, yeah, in Madrid, Spain. That's that's where I live right now. And the, the founder uh, is an ex Yearn uh, developer, mm. and he created a a protocol to spin up debt facilities on chain. Um, and why do we believe this is uh, somewhat related mm -hmm. to, to, to refi or, or our Crane Earth thesis? Because one of the major issues that we saw um, in my centrifuge days, but as well over the mm -hmm. last uh, years as investor, is that we're not getting enough money into, into certain areas, into the climate space in that case, into project developers, to plant trees, to build solar panels, project finance, whatever it is. And why is that? Because it's too expensive to set up a debt facility. Mm -hmm. So it needs to have a certain size. It needs to be a hundred million to be exciting for the Goldman Sachs of the world. And so if it's like a $500,000 need that a project has, you're just not getting it financed. Um, you do have the, the money sitting there, family office that want to do it, mm -hmm. but just the setup cost is too high with a hundred grand. 
So having something with for a few thousand bucks, mm -hmm. you can set up a debt facility, small, and then start investors uh, pouring in and get the money to to someone. We feel is a, a super powerful enabler for climate financing. And and these debt facilities are they on chain? They're on chain. Yeah. They're hidden. I mean hidden, not not purposely hidden, but mm -hmm. abstracted. So it's easy for the lender and the borrower to work mm -hmm. with it. But the infrastructure is actually uh, built on chain with all the efficiencies we we discussed before: transparency, mm -hmm. uh, no middlemen, and 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 so on. So that's where like, the company is called Fence, Fence dot Finance. Um, cool. And yeah. Nice. And and does it is it. Um, Obviously, these aren't going to be collateralized debt facilities. So, what what is the process in which trust or um, credibility is established? There is, there is relatively that part is relatively traditional, yeah. um, but automated. So it's a it's a technology play, but mm -hmm. it, at the same time, it's a it's a legal play to get uh, SPVs in that case, like spun up really, really, really affordable and really fast and really cheap. Right. So there is this very traditional put the assets in an SPV. In, in the good old meat world mm -hmm. um, and uh, finance them that way. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense to me because we do see that a lot of projects, reforestation projects, regenerative agricultural transitions, renewable energy, like they need some additional startup capital That's or right. initial uh, debt facilities. And because of the current uh, limitations of the system that favor economies of scale, um, the results is that a lot of these smaller projects don't get funded and it typically is larger corporates or people that can afford all of those lawyers and banks and exactly. so forth that actually get funded. And so, yeah, infrastructure like this, I think, could bring more to the yeah. edges. And I mean, this, it's, it's, what, it's one of the promises of, of what we did Centrifuge as well, right? To, to have an infrastructure and Centrifuge to, to, to allow smaller investors as well to, to chime in. Mm -hmm. and uh, be able to to invest and not just large ticket investors mm -hmm. and again have smaller pools of capital for music royalties for our first carbon pool was just a million bucks where well who, who in the real world in the trad fight does a, a million dollar pool for anything or well, mm -hmm. they don't call it pool they call it whatever facility mm -hmm. um so yeah that's 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 the whole prem promise premise of uh, real world assets and carbon financing as a special case yeah so, you know, Crane Earth, very, you know, clear thesis around refi, uh, regenerative finance, um, you know, the Web3 environment. And curious, like, what's the receptivity you're finding with LPs? Are people understanding this space? Is there more money coming? Is it kind of a crypto winter freeze? Like, where, where are we at? I mean, there are LPs where as soon as the word Web3, crypto or whatever comes up, it's like a no. I mm. got encouraged a few times to actually drop it from our pitch. and. Mm -hmm. and no, I'm not fucking doing that. That's that's what I believe in. <laughs> right. That's what I can. That's, that's what we're good in, Philip and myself. Mm. Um, and by the way, I mean, I'm not here pretending that Web3 will solve our climate crisis. That's not the pitch. Right. But Web3, like other technologies, Web3 mm. will help us accelerate, scale, and find solutions for the shit we're in. So that's our thesis. Um, and so if, if an LP doesn't believe in that, I'm not trying to convince anybody. No, it's just a short conversation and then yeah. maybe in the next life. Um, and, and there are some of them. Web3 is just a no-go, complicated and, and FTX and, mm -hmm. and, and the environment uh, of uh, crypto and Web3. Uh, still, still, by the way, get that every every few weeks, a pushback on uh, uh, how, how blockchain is hurting, hurting the environment. All right. Um, other than that, it, it, it resonates quite well if, if we present it as one of the tools like AI will help with uh, pharmaceutical research and a gazillion other things. AI Web3 will help with a lot of things among them, our climate crisis. Mm -hmm. um, and that resonates quite well with investors. The truth is things take a little bit longer. We are not in the best environment to raise a fund as a mm -hmm. emerging first time manager. So would have expected uh, after we closed our anchor LP in uh, in in February, beginning of February, that things move faster. Yes, mm -hmm. uh, but these are the days. So it I sounds like change an that. entrepreneur turning into a VC and being a bit impatient as well. Yeah, kind of, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I kind of used this. It's always hard work to find a lead, yeah. in, in, like in the VC slash founder world. But once you have a lead, typically it's easy to fill. Yeah. That's not right now. That's mm -hmm. not in the LP world. I learned. Yeah, that's okay. It takes time. And, and it's it does seem like there's a lot of climate tech financing, funding pools of capital that have been emerging in the last few years um, for large scale infrastructure projects. Right. Um, and so how, how do you differentiate yourselves 
or see the universe? Is there a lot of bleed over overlap between kind of climate tech and this kind of space? Look, I mean, it's a pretty unique intersection. I mean, you see mm. that at this event we are today, there is not that many experts uh, that know Web3, mm -hmm. like, like not just from an investment perspective, but from a builder perspective. Um, there's not that many um, VCs or wannabe VCs, I still struggle to call myself a VC, <laughs> uh, investors that uh, that come from a builder background. Mm -hmm. More so in the US, in Europe, we don't have that many like Philip and myself that built five companies, uh, a few of them in Web3. So I think that's one differentiator. Like yeah. we're really deep in Web3, we understand it. Yeah. We understand how to build companies. Uh, we understand the TreadFi world as well, which is important because we build fintech companies. Mm -hmm. um, we understand the corporate world as well. We built for, with, against, and now part of SAP, which is the biggest corporate software company in the world. So I think that that separates us mm -hmm. and differentiates us like quite substantially from other investors. Yeah, I, I would say from an entrepreneur founder perspective, you're kind of like an ideal archetype of, of a venture capitalist because you have a builder and understanding of what it's like to be in the entrepreneur seat and you have real domain expertise. And then now you're also bringing cap oh, capital to the table. Exactly. Yeah. And I, we shared uh, an investor, you know, with um, your previous company and, and my previous company with Matrix Partners. Actually. Oh, yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah, right, right. And we had Josh Hanna uh, on our board and same, same. on the journey for a long time. Josh is a great guy. He's kind yes. of the ideal VC as well. And the, and the part fantastic. of the reason we all got along so well was because he was an entrepreneur. Who, who then went over That's into right. venture capital. Exactly. That's right. So mm -hmm. he was helpful. He understood the troubles yeah. uh, we go through. Um, so yeah, that's that's a little bit what we plan on doing and do already with our angel portfolio. Yeah. 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 So if an entrepreneur is thinking about starting something in this field and wants to reach out, I mean, not only just practically how do they do that, but also like how would you advise them to um, yeah, approach, position or, you know, kind of make that kind of uh, pitch or exploration with you? I mean, for us, it is a differentiator is that there needs to be some sort of Web3 angle. And I get a lot of inbound today where there, there is not even a Web3 angle planned. Mm -hmm. That's just something there's better mm. investors for whatever pure MRV or just pick something. It's not our superpower. Mm -hmm. um, so if someone wants to work with us uh, at Crane Earth, they got to be a heavy at least a plan. I mean, some some company, some some projects still build very Web 2 y but have in mind to build the Web 3 angle later. Um, we need to see that. Mm -hmm. We'd love to see that. Love to understand that. Um, other than that, uh, I don't know what else I can can recommend. As early as possible. That's one thing mm. we love. Like PowerPoint is fine. Um, that doesn't mean we would immediately invest. Uh, sometimes it makes sense to to work together and get some first traction going. Mm -hmm. um, but we like we like early. We like pre-seed. We like uh, mm -hmm. friends and family. We, we like that stuff. Nice. Yeah. And do you have any points of view about structuring the financial arrangement with founders? How does that differ in this Web3 paradigm because you're bringing the potential of tokens into the equation? You mean... <sighs> like traditionally a Series A might take, what, 20, 30 percent of the cap table in exchange for the check that they write. Pretty clear, right? And now what we have is kind of like the equity of the company that might be raising money. But then you also have like the network. Many of these projects are launching tokens, and those tokens are not always clear in terms of what the securities, you know, regulations are even going to be, um, or they're well in advance, uh, you know, something far off into the future. And so, how do you, yeah, like how is it different in yeah. this paradigm? So, so I don't know if I have a super answer here or perfect mm -hmm. one. I'm just sharing a little bit what we did at Centrifuge mm -hmm. in 2000. What was it? 17, like really early six years ago. We raised a very traditional seed round from great investors, Blue Yard, Mosaic in Europe, um, semantic inflection, uh, uh, Web3, Web2 mm. investors. And we, the token site letters didn't exist back then, right? Uh, which, which we see today. But mm. we had a little of a, a, a statement in our investor rights agreement that at one point there will be a token and we'll figure it out together. Obviously, there was some legal language around, but actually fairly simple. We'll figure out together mm -hmm. how we convert then your equity into the resulting token if there is a token. Mm -hmm. um, that is not enough. The second thing I would, would encourage you is to make sure you pick the right investors that understand that, that you trust, that you can work with. Like, I mean, if I'm investing in a startup, I 
in its so early stage, it is not clear how the token will look like. Mm -hmm. It's not clear what the ratio should be between the equity, how many token everybody should get. Mm -hmm. So the only thing I can say is like, look for an investor that understands um, that there will be a token, is okay with it, and where there is trust between the founders and the investors that this conversation will be done in a way that makes sense for all parties. The, the, uh, and then obviously one given, even if there is a token coming out, there gotta be a lockup. Uh, mm. Similar to the equity takes longer to, to, to be liquid, you need a token lockup uh, defined. Mm. But I, I like to define those things along the way if you have the right investors. And that's a, that's a big if, I will admit. Yeah, yeah, and I guess I, I'm a little bit like skeptical that this is going to work out as well for a lot of Web3 founders, because it seems to me like we don't have a lot of exits, clearly, or IPOs in the Web3 space to look, to draw upon. So a lot of the investors for the last several years are either basing their returns on token returns or on still future hopes and dreams. Right, but we don't have like very clear. There's not a lot of M and A. There's not a lot of That's e true. exits. That's right? true. So it it does seem like we're a little bit schizophrenic. Of are we thinking that this is going to be like traditional technology companies where the equity of the companies are what really are going to provide the returns, or are we moving into a token paradigm where the tokens are the returns, and you know, maybe maybe the founders are getting best of both worlds because it does seem like a lot of people are trying to take two scoops, right? They're increasing the surface area of financial capture. Yeah. You can invest in my LLC or my C Corp, you know, over here on the equity side. And oh, by the way, I have a token and I have, you know, this much reserve for the team and so forth. Um, but but ultimately that money somewhat dilutes, right? Like the total value capture has to then now sit in two buckets. And so, yeah, I'm curious how you and think I, about I, that. I, and I don't believe in that actually. I mean, okay. I, I believe what you said, but I don't believe that it's the right strategy. So I'm right. a little bit like, I understand as an investor, I want the insurance of uh, having equity in a company, but if it's clear that this project is building something that will result in a token, yeah. a network or whatever for scale, whatever the reason is that there, there's a token and there are many, um, I understand the investor perspective of having equity in the company in case mm -hmm. the project right. pivots or issues a second token or whatever the insurance policy gives you. Mm -hmm. But there got to be at some point in time a decision between the two. I do not believe yeah. that it's helpful to have equity in a company and at the same time token in a token network. Both are live because very likely they're conflicting uh, right. uh, priorities. Like there's a for profit, um, maybe there's some consulting stuff often going on ahead of those situations mm -hmm. and completely different incentives than maximizing here the token and, and, and scaling the token network. Mm -hmm. So I do not believe that the same parties should hold equity and token in the same project. Yeah. I just don't think that works. Yeah, We, we I, closed I, actually centrifuge the equity doesn't exist anymore. Oh, cool. So we literally migrated over and there is no company. Yeah, I think that I think that I'm, that's what I'm basically trying to say as well. I, I do think that yeah, making a choice is is cleaner yeah. and better, and especially since the token will often have mechanisms of value sharing with users or other stakeholders, and that's part of the beauty of tokens, yeah. right? Whereas traditional Web two companies they didn't share their equity with the users on the platforms, right? I don't have any equity in Upside mm -hmm. and Facebook, right? That's right. Um, whereas in the Web three world. I can potentially participate in the overall value creation by having tokens as a user of some new Web3 social network. And, but if we split the two value capture mechanisms out where there's equity in the company and then there's the token, um, then you now have kind of conflicting incentive structures. That's right, exactly. And of course, if the investors over here are on the equity side, um, then that means less for the users and the, stake the other exactly stakeholders true. of the ecosystem. I do understand the investor view though, and I still got to get used to be one of those. Um, <laughs> I mean, there were many, many projects that had pretty big fuck ups by issuing just a second token. Weren't happy with the first token and then some <laughs> right. investors were out of luck because yeah. oh, well, just, you got that first token, but the new one is just not yours or just got portion of it. If you at least are in the equity, you can control somehow the issuance of the Totally. So that I understand this game totally. as an insurance policy. I still don't like it. Yeah. So it's basically just at, at, at a developmental level coming in in the equity of the starting legal structure makes perfect sense. Correct. 
but then working towards, if there is a roadmap towards token, working towards kind of the migration of that equity into a shared token incentive alignment pool with, with all of the stakeholders. Exactly. You make a yeah. choice at one point and don't, yeah. don't, don't hedge all the time. And how, how concerned are you about the current regulatory landscape being in the United States? Very unclear about how to do tokens. Very. I'm not, look, I'm not, not a lawyer, not a regulatory expert. I always was yeah, fortunate enough to have some co-founders around me that were deep in that stuff. Mm. Um, I am uh, looking what happens in the States right now. Uh, it's, it's, I feel actually some of the startups that I advised or angel invested in the last few years, I always push them to have some, not a subsidiary, but of the headquarter move to the, to, 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 to Delaware. I feel a little bit bad right now for some of those because mm. it's very unclear. It's very hostile, as we all know. Um, I don't know where it will end. Um, Politically, uh, it's 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 unfortunately on the wrong side for me personally. Uh, the ones that favor crypto, um, so it's very difficult where the where the US will end. Um, I'm hopeful though, about Europe uh, in that context. So um, Europe has a little bit clearer regulations or coming regulations. Some of them actually acted on um, that give me as a founder or as an investor clearer guidance what I can do and what I can't do. So at Centrifuge, we always, because it was unclear, played very conservative. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel in Europe now, we know pretty much what's possible, what's a stable coin, what isn't, what, what's the security. Um, but, but when it comes to the US, I, I don't know where this will end. It's mm -hmm. just not looking good with the SEC being unclear mm -hmm. um, and pretty much every other body being, being not, helpful. not yeah. helpful. It's not a climate where as a founder, as a founder, I wouldn't found right now in the US. No, I yeah. would wait. Yeah. It hurts me. Yeah, it is painful as an American citizen to see the um, the brightest the brain drain. Uh, yeah, folks right. I'm, in this I'm, space. I'm, I'm, I'm a citizen myself, you, mm -hmm. US. So I'll, I'll feel you. It just hurts me to see that uh, everything. I'm European too, so I'll kind of right. win a little bit. Yeah, it's yeah, like in yeah. soccer when I see Germany, <laughs> France, and the US. I have like three horses, um, it, it, but it still hurts me to see people just leaving whatever mm. San Francisco, New York. Uh, for Asia, for somewhere, because mm -hmm. it's just clearer for them. It's easier to build something there. Yeah. And I guess, I mean, it, it remains to be seen because it does feel like San Francisco is somewhat reclaiming its place in the technology ecosystem with AI. It does. And it seems like all of a sudden, you know, we're back to San Francisco with the AI ecosystem. But I am curious, like, what other places you see um, emerging as hotspots within Web3 for talent? Yeah. So Berlin for a while, mm -hmm. pre-COVID, mm -hmm. I would say was definitely such a place. Mm -hmm. uh, COVID, people left uh, and uh, all, all over the world. Portugal is pretty dense, mm -hmm. so Lisbon is, is is quite nice. Madrid, not so much. I tried to change it a little bit and attract some founders there. There's talent in Madrid, mm -hmm. uh, just no, no crypto mindset. Um, but yeah, Berlin, still a little, Lisbon. Asia, I'm not an expert. I mean, mm -hmm. obviously, there's a lot happening there, but that's mm -hmm. not my my area of expertise or superpower there. Mm -hmm. But I think Singapore and, and, and could be a winner. Yeah. And when you come to the States, is it mostly New York and San Francisco? It's mostly New, uh, San Francisco, sometimes New York. Yeah, those are the places. Yeah. I lived 12 years in San Francisco, so that's why it's natural to, to visit friends there and, mm -hmm. and do business. But yeah, it's mostly mostly San Francisco. Got it. Great. Well, are there any other thoughts or reflections on the Web3 space more broadly and kind of the moment we find ourselves in 2023? We're here at the ReFi Summit. Um, yeah, I was just curious, any other commentary? I don't know. I mean, we talked a lot about carbon. I mean, ReFi is broader than carbon. We briefly touched on a couple of areas. So quite excited to see those areas, whether this is renewable energy on chain, whether this is biodiversity, whether this is... Um, even boring stuff like uh, traceability uh, on, 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 on soft supply chains, moving them on on public ledgers. Mm. So I think there's a lot in refi happening that's outside of carbon. I just want to yeah. clarify that and we're excited about that. Great. Any final words or messages? No, um, let's keep building. Uh, let's keep doing cool shit. I would love that. Awesome. Thank you, Max, for being here. Thank you. Cheers. I hope you liked that conversation with Max Ament. I thought it was interesting what he said about assets, not just moving on chain, but really originating on chain. I also appreciated what he shared about when there is a token, focusing on value accrual there, rather than splitting it with company equity. 
And of course, it's always sad to hear about the brain drain from the United States in the entrepreneurial community due to regulatory uncertainty. But hopefully we can see more constructive approaches soon. To learn more and engage with Crane Earth, go to craneearth.vc. You can also check out our conversation with Philip Stellick, co-founder of Crane Earth. There's a link in the show notes. And you can see all of our discussions at maearth.com. Please like, share, subscribe. And I invite you to join our community Discord as we explore these intersections of regenerative finance, technology, and our living planet. Thanks for tuning in, and I'll see you on the next one. Thank you.